Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 40 Days live event on racial fatigue featuring the Reverend Mitchell Anderson. I will introduce Mitchell more fully in a moment. Uh, my name is Adele Holliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. So thank you for joining us and being here today. This 40 Days live event is one part of the ongoing 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. And we are one week into this dynamic program. Um, and each day uh, of this program will features opportunities for learning, um, for learning, for exploring uh, faith reflections, for um, children's activities, ideas for group commitments and advocacy. So we hope that you might participate in the fullest of the program. Um, this is just a, a preview of what's, what's available uh, on the United Church's website if you search for four days of engagement or 40 days, um, you'll come to this uh, page, which gives an overview of the, the, the program, which is running from October 12th to November 26th. If you wanted to focus specifically on Mitchell's um, reflection, you can go to day seven uh, and click on racial fatigue, and you'll come to an overview of the page itself. And at the very bottom of the page, if you click on downloads, then you can, you'll access a full PDF, which has all of the activities and learnings and a conversation for the day. That's possible for any days of the 40 days to go into the website and um, pull down all the content. And there's lots of themes and ideas to explore. Another feature during the 40 days is that we are featuring books um, and they are all available from the United Church Bookstore. There's a discount of 20% if you order two or more books. Um, so this week we are featuring the book called The Other Side of the, uh, the, Other Side of the River from Church Pew to Sweat Lodge by Alf Dumont. Um, and this is an excellent book exploring worlds between indigenous and settler. So again, if you order uh, two or more books, uh, you'd receive a discount of 20% off and please just use the discount code 40 days. And this is, these are all facets of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. People are engaging online. If you wanted to join the conversation on Facebook, um, there is conversation happening there as well. So without further ado, I will welcome and introduce um, Mitchell Anderson, who's our featured speaker today. And Reverend Mitchell Anderson is lead minister at St. Andrew's United Church in Saskatoon and serves on the executive of the General Council. He is Dene Soutele and a member of the English River First Nation. So a warm welcome to Mitchell, who will lead us in conversation. And for everybody, please feel free to use the chat throughout the conversation. You can ask questions. You can, um, we're going to have a bit of a dialogue between us, and you may have questions to add as well. So please feel free to uh, put those into the chat. So thanks, and over to you, Mitchell. Thank you. Sorry, we just figuring out Zoom things. It muted everyone for uh, to make sure we can all hear each other well. Uh, my name is Mitchell. I'm actually the lead minister at St. Paul's United Church, although St. Andrew is also a great person to be named after, but we've got the joy of being named after uh, St. Paul, Apostle to the Nations. Um, and so I just want to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm joining you from the territory of Treaty 6, uh, which is uh, includes the uh, relation with uh, many of my Cree relatives and ancestors and aunts and cousins and friends, uh, as well as other nations. And this is also the homeland of my mother's people, the Métis Nation, uh, and the homeland of the Dakota. And so I'd invite you, as uh, you are able, to type in the chat uh, where you're joining today from, the uh, uh, territory uh, or lands that uh, you make home, and who are the Indigenous peoples uh, who've stewarded your lands for many years. Uh, we get to gather in this way from uh, all kinds of different parts of our country from coast to coast to coast and uh, the waters and lands uh, that have uh, been cared for by many peoples over many years are ones that we we all treasure and that inform and inspire us. Uh, and uh, I'll invite us to just open with a word of prayer. Uh, God, you are good and we thank you for the opportunity to gather. You invite and encourage and challenge us to grow spiritually 
uh, to seek to wrestle with you and with one another, that we might uh, experience your Holy Spirit at work in our hearts, transforming us and changing us, uh, helping us to grow more deeply uh, into the fullness of who you've created us to be. There are great challenges in our time as there are in all times, God. Challenges of colonialism and racial injustice and of many things that are linked to them, of gendered violence, of uh, climate catastrophe. And so in this moment, God, we pray for your spirit to guide us, to give us hope and strength and wisdom that we might experience in our lives uh, the renewal of all things that you pledge and promise uh, for us all. Help us as we turn these 40 days to questions of racial justice, to all the ways where you uh, lead us, to all the ways where you send us into the world uh, to fill the world with your justice. And in the life-giving name of Jesus Christ, we say, amen. Thank you, Mitchell, for opening us in such a good way. Uh, so some questions for a conversation. We'll just have a bit of a dialogue. So, um, so racial fatigue is the name of your written piece. And I wonder if you can share a little bit more about what you mean by the term racial fatigue. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a hard year life um, in, uh, you know, to be a, an indigenous person. Um, hard in the sense that, um, you know, things go on and they don't always happen in convenient times. And so I, you know, I was uh, struck uh, many times throughout this year about, you know, just how hard the news was. Um, you know, and that's not, I'm not the kind of guy, you know, cries at movies or things like that. And those people exist and that's great. Uh, but, you know, um, just how, uh, it was wearing on my soul just being uh, in the world with everything going on. And I was trying to find ways to think about it. And, and I kept coming back to this idea of fatigue. Um, I was tired. Uh, and it's, it's not a fatigue in, you know, the, you know, after you run a really long run at the end, you're tired, but it's more of like a constant uh, everyday buildup of little things. Um, and so that's what I was trying to, to reflect on in the piece was, um, what are the ways where, for me as an Indigenous person, and I think in other ways, other people of color also um, experience a kind of weariness, of tiredness, of being worn down by the, the world, um, by all kinds of different injustices? Yes, thanks for that, Mitchell. I, for me as a racialized person, your piece really resonated with me and, and some of my experiences. So thanks again for, for writing that. And your, your written piece particularly focuses on the experiences of Indigenous and racialized peoples and the stressors that many among us face. Um, are there other ideas or concepts that racial fatigue is related to? Yeah, so I, I uh, turned out after I'd picked those words, um, uh, a Black scholar named William Smith had, had referred to it as racial battle fatigue, even stronger language than mine about how, you know, going into the world for, for him and um, in his experience, other Black people can feel like a, a battle. Um, and a, a broader concept uh, that I've uh, studied in undergrad and encountered of minority stress, that there's uh, stressors when you're living as a minoritized person in a world not designed for you in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, I'm a, a gay person and certainly, you know, the, the experience of um, sometimes of spaces that are clearly not meant for me. You know, I remember uh, getting a form uh, and uh, it asked for my wife's name. It's like, well, don't have one, um, but I am in a, you know, a long-term committed relationship with someone very important to me. Um, but I, he's not a wife, um, you know, and, and, you know, those examples that people of, of many different identities will experience. I think there's resonances in the, the you know, none of them are ever, or they're very rarely, the huge spectacular things, but it's the constant uh, ongoing little things that build up that I think is what I wanted to wanted to speak to and to name and to explore. Yes, thank you. So the constant ongoing little things that build up, uh, particularly for Indigenous and racialized peoples. Um, now, sometimes, though, uh, white people will name that um, 
they are feeling tired that indigenous and racialized people continue to name racial injustice. So they're maybe tired of hearing about racism. Um, how, how is racial fatigue different from this? Yeah, you know, if you're, if you're tired of hearing about it, uh, imagine how it must be, how it must feel to live it. Um, and, and I think the other point I would make is uh, it's not optional for me. I can't go into space uh, except as, you know, a brown skinned person, as a visibly, uh, you know, visibly as a person of color. I can't opt out. Um, I can't take a break. Um, you know, there is no uh, real, you know, escape as it were. Um, and so I think the, the difference is that it's not, uh, I can never choose not to engage in these questions. You know, I didn't set out to be a, an activist. I didn't set out to make racial justice a, you know, a part of my, my ministry. It's, it's um, kind of just what you have to do if you're going to be a, a leader of color in a lot of ways, you know, you can't get away from it. Um, and so, but it is real, I think, to ask the questions of what is sustainable and, you know, I think we've heard of, you know, doom scrolling of where you just go through Twitter, TikTok, the news, whatever it is, and just consume so much negativity um, of all of the pain in the world. Uh, you know, and I think that we, we evolved in very small groups, humans, you know, groups of, you know, you maybe a core group of a few dozen, and then you'd meet up at different times of the year in different cultures with larger groups. And, you know, in a lifetime, you'd maybe know a few hundred people. And now... Uh, we are connected to thousands and we hear the stories of millions or even billions. And, you know, I think it's important to recognize our hearts aren't capable of absorbing the pain of 7 billion people every day. Um, and so, well, of, of course, I want to remind uh, white people that the work of racial justice continues and needs to continue. Um, but I, I do think the, the question of sustainability um, is important for all of us, uh, regardless of our race. But what can we do and what can we sustain and what can we do in healthy ways? Um, I, I'm not a good singer as maybe the people at St. Paul's will attest, but uh, what I've heard an image uh, that has resonated with people who are singers, which is that you can sustain a note as long as most people are singing it, but one person can drop out for a breath and then join back in. Uh, and But you can't all do that at the same time. And so that's, I think a good image for uh, any kind of justice seeking work is it's okay for all of us to step back for moments to take a breath and to get back in when we're ready. Uh, but that, you know, we we can't, none of us go 100% to 100% of the time, no matter who we are. Uh, so and I don't think it's what we should ask of ourselves. And I don't think it's what God wants us to do. Great. So a reminder to not out, not opt out completely, um, but do what we need to do to sustain ourselves for this work in the in the long in the long haul. So thanks for that. Um, I wonder if we can turn to our 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 Bible for a moment. So are there some places? What are some places where we hear about stories of weariness in um, in the Bible and some of our biblical stories? Yeah, they abound. Um... The Psalms are littered with um, anguish and pain and frustration at uh, how God sometimes seems slow. Um, or I think of some of the letters of the early church where uh, people had an expectation that Jesus would return right away. And then they get angry and frustrated. And, you know, Paul has to remind them, you know, some say that the Lord is slow, but the Lord is never slow, but is patient with you. And a day with God is like, a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Um, you know, I think it's a recurring story because it's part of life, uh, weariness, tiredness, fatigue. Um, you know, I think of the story of, of Hagar who's described as enduring hardship. Uh, and that enduring word I think says a lot that it's, it's not that she experienced a single hardship but that her daily living was in some sense hard uh, as were, you know, all of the people of God in Egypt, um, all of the people of Israel uh, endured hardship and oppression uh, there prior to the, the freedom of the Exodus. And so I think we hear in these stories of God's faithfulness uh, with and for people who are struggling, people who are enduring hardship, and that God's okay with us being expressing it, that God is okay with the psalmist yelling at God about, you know, where are you? What are you doing? Why am I stuck in this? Um, God can take it. And God wants that, you know, healthy engagement uh, with God uh, in the fullness of who we are. 
So I think uh, those are uh, useful stories. And we see it even as well in the stories of Jesus that you know, uh, he describes power flowing from him uh, when uh, a woman with a, a bleeding disorder touches him and is healed. Uh, and he notices the power leaving him. Mark tells, tells us that uh, by becoming flesh in, in Jesus, God experiences finitude and limitation and tiredness. And I think that's really important that, you know, if I'm tired after a long day, well, Jesus was too. Uh, and that, that um, you know, it's like uh, St. Irenaeus says that uh, that which has not been assumed has not been saved. So when God takes on our tiredness, uh, God in some sense is redeeming and joining us in that and in solidarity with all creation. And so I think the incarnation of God in Jesus also helps, helps inform that, that uh, God has experienced being tired too. God has had long days too in Jesus. And so again, it's okay when we do. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that overview and for that encouragement. Um, you also offer some encouragement uh, in your piece about when you, with the phrase, refuse to be worn out. Uh, I wonder if you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, a lot happened this summer. And uh, a scholar who has been deeply influential on my thinking, uh, a person named Lauren Berlant, uh, and they were a, a scholar of English at the uh, University of Chicago. And uh, so I was going through their blog, uh, which is online, and uh, in it, Lauren describes um, a group of their colleagues who had this motto, uh, we refuse to be worn out. Uh, and uh, the first piece of Berlant's that I ever read was uh, something called Slow Death, a uh, very bleak uh, name for a title, uh, but it was talking about how um, the ways that injustice operates on people is not always in the spectacular, it's not always what makes the news, but it's in the slow uh, ways that uh, people get sort of ground down by oppression and injustice. Um, I did a summer uh, as part of clinical pastoral education that many of the clergy on, on here will have experienced in different ways at a, at a hospital here in Saskatoon. Uh, and I had a, I was assigned for the summer to a surgery ward, uh, people generally with short stays, most of whom uh, were uh, indigenous uh, over the course of that summer. And, and many of whom were experiencing amputations connected with experiences of diabetes. And uh, while Berlant hadn't directly tackled that, I went back and read Slow Death uh, probably once a week that summer uh, because it helped me make sense of, you know, what are the years of conditions, you know, a lifetime of conditions that resulted, you know, in this moment of an amputation um, of someone's uh, often, you know, foot or leg, uh, but that it was a buildup of many, many things. And so I think the gift that, that Berlant has given me is um, this, this slowness and attending to the slowness of injustice. It's not always explosive or spectacular, but it's often uh, in the everyday. And in that, you know, then Berlant has their motto to refuse to be worn out. And it's refusal, I think, is, is a really powerful word about, you know, a, an aggressive, decisive, clear no to what is trying to wear you down, um, trying to wear you out. I think we need that. Uh, I like the boldness that they offered there of refusal. I think that's a good word because there's lots of things in our life that need to be refused, uh, that need that that bold, uh, powerful declaration of no, and that's what refusal to be worn out means to me. Excellent, thank you. Um, just an encouragement to everyone who's here. If you have questions uh, for Mitchell, you're welcome to write them into the chat, and we'll weave those into the conversation as well. So please feel free to ask questions or make comments on some of the things that you've heard. Uh, those Please. are very welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so Mitchell, back to you. So this phrase refused to be worn out. Um, in the Bible, are there some examples of stories where people have really refused to be worn out? Yeah, I'm really, um, you know, it's, it's fitting that this, I don't know if you did this on purpose, Adele, but assigned this one for the seventh day of the 40 days of engagement. It gives us a, a really good, um, uh, a really good fitting that this is, you know, the the Sabbath uh, in a sense of of the the forty days, uh, and that that rhythm of Sabbath uh, I think is vitally important. Um, that it's uh, built into the narrative of Scripture 
uh, this rhythm of rest and renewal is God's intention for the creation when God rests on the seventh day. And then when God rescues God's people out of Egypt, um, where they had to work and endure hardship every day, God gives them instruction that includes rhythms of rest and renewal, both weekly, but then also uh, in, in tides to the seasons of the year, uh, and then in patterns of seven years and of sevens of seven years with the Jubilee. There's this, um, and it's not just rest for humans, but it's also about rest for the land. Uh, and because our relationship with one another and with land are of course always connected. Uh, and so social and ecological renewal are at the heart of God's design uh, in Torah. And I think that's really important for us uh, to understand and to uh, enjoy and appreciate um, and ask for ourselves, okay, what does that mean in a world where um, that is not how the rhythms of the world around us are structured? So how do we practice uh, Sabbath in, in other ways? And I'm terrible at that. So I'll be the first to admit that, you know, I, sometimes people in my congregation will ask me, what day do you take off? And I sort of said, well, this week, it's kind of like mostly Monday and uh, maybe Tuesday morning. And then um, another week, it's like, oh, this week, it's kind of not really happening. Uh, so, you know, that uh, I'm technically on study leave this week and, and uh, spending it with all of you working. So, um, you know, I, I'm bad at that. I'll be the first to admit it. But I think that's important. And Jesus models it too. Again, uh, we're, we're told these stories of how, you know, after a difficult time in ministry, he would uh, go off into the wilderness or go off into a distant place just to be away from people. Um, and I, I can really appreciate that. You know, I love people. I'm a deep, deep extrovert. But uh, when the phone rings the, you know, eighth time and the seventh person, person walks into the church office, when you're trying to do something, it's nice to just go someplace where you can't be found and uh, do whatever you need to do. So I think uh, we see that. And uh, the Holy Spirit is described as empowering and energizing um, the early church. Uh, Paul in, was it Colossians, talks about um, the energy of Jesus Christ powerfully at work in him. And I think, you know, there's these, these stories that remind us that it's not our strength that we rely on to do our work. Uh, but it's the strength and energy and power that comes from God through the Holy Spirit and through uh, Jesus Christ in us. Yes, yes, absolutely. Great. Um, Mitchell, a few people were asking just in the chat about if you could just go over the, again, the name of the book that you mentioned and the author, if you can just yes. remind us. Of so um, uh, a great intro book is called Cruel Optimism uh, by Lauren Berlant. And uh, I saw uh, the very Reverend Jordan Cantwell share their name in the chat. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for a, a shorter piece, Slow Death, uh, and it, it's not a, a fun read, uh, but it's it's just brilliant. So um, I would encourage you, um, as you have time and energy to, to you know, they're, they're thick, they're academic works. Um, and I read them in seminars and we spent, you know, a three hour class just uh, going through it. So, you know, they're, they're, they're not easy light reads, but they're, uh, if you wanna go deeper into some academic concepts, uh, that's a really interesting place to start. And, and again, Lauren's work was really, influential on me. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, a question has emerged in the chat. Um, no, it doesn't relate directly to racial fatigue, uh, but the person is wondering um, what might be some of the things that a white ally can do to help tangibly dismantle um, the system of white privilege. Um, so what might people do? Any, any thoughts, ideas? <laughs> oh. Sorry, I muted myself to type into the chat so you wouldn't hear my clicking. Uh, I forgot I, 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 need, I need permission to unmute. Um, uh, uh, that's a great question. And I think uh, there's a number of things, you know, there's many, many things, of course. Um, I think part of it begins with, oh, thank you. Uh, part of it begins with thinking of our own lives and uh, what do we, where do we need to, uh, learn and grow um, and attending to that. Uh, and so doing some of our own work as well is a good place to start. And then I, um, you know, the theme of my message is really about what is sustainable and healthy for us and life-giving along the way. Um, and so I would also advise that about, um, sometimes we're tempted to want to change the world overnight 
Uh, but again, like um, it, was, it was Peter, Second Peter uh, says, you know, some think that the Lord is slow, but the Lord is never slow, but is patient with you. Um, and I think that, that that discipline of patience, you know, it's a fruit of the spirit is something important to uh, practice here. You know, I want everything to be fixed tomorrow too, uh, but that's not how it's going to get done. And so uh, to ask what are the uh, sustainable things uh, that you can do in your life? Um, and I would highlight uh, for me, I think, the most important thing uh, for me when it comes to me as an indigenous person is around relationships with land. Uh, and so I think of really inspiring things I've seen in my own province, for example, around uh, landowners committing to, to treaty uh, sharing networks about ensuring that, that they would allow lands that they steward uh, to be accessed by uh, indigenous nations um, to exercise our treaty rights. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really, uh, big, powerful example, uh, but there might be uh, other smaller ones that might be uh, important. Um, I talked in the in the piece and an action you might do, uh, you know, about the importance of time off, and it was it was uh, interesting. Um, who got time off on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? Uh, and what I wondered in the community I live in, where um, you know, if you look at educational attainment rates, you know, indigenous people are much less likely to be in um, professional sectors, many of which had, like myself included, uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation off, and are much more likely to be working in, in service sector jobs, um, which were open. And so it's interesting for me that the, the people for whom the day was intended, uh, many of them uh, were not the ones who benefited. And so I think, um, I think of that then the, in terms of what you can do, um, two things. There was a great initiative by the Circle on uh, Aboriginal People in, in Philanthropy uh, called One Day's Pay, which is if you got uh, the, the day off uh, and, and holiday pay for the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, like I did, uh, is to give as you're able, recognizing you know we all have different abilities uh, to pay. But uh, you know, so I gave the, I calculated one, 200 and whatever of my annual salary. And I, I gave that to an indigenous organization uh, in recognition of that day that I got off. Um, and so that would be something you could do. And uh, write to your provincial governments if your provincial government doesn't have, hasn't recognized the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and ask for it to be off. Uh, and um, you know those are, those are small ways, but they're important. They're days of rest and renewal and recovery for the people who, who frankly need them the most, so. Thank you, Mitchell, for these very helpful and tangible examples. Very good, excellent. Um, so going back to your written piece, um, in your writing, you asked the question, if you're not indigenous or racialized, what would it look like to create space for your indigenous, racialized, indigenous or racialized family, friends, or colleagues to refuse to be worn out? So would you have any ideas or examples of what space, such spaces might look like? Yeah, I want to uh, lift up a, a, a colleague, um, the, uh, Jordan Cantwell, who's a uh, minister at St. Martin's United here in Saskatoon. Um, during some of all of this uh, news, um, I uh, was trying to take a, a different study leave, I think it was, um, or a week of holidays or something, and I was just, uh, I was worn out. Uh, and uh, Jordan stepped in and uh, took on a little bit of the, the challenge of uh, helping out some, some stuff at St. Paul's for me for, for that day. And it wasn't a big thing, but it just meant that someone both realized how this might be impacting me and cared and was going to do something um, meant a lot. Uh, it meant uh, a tremendous amount. And so, you know, I think that's, that's part of it um, is recognizing when things happen in the news that they might impact people differently. And so um, hearing about, uh, you know, Discovery Zone right grades of residential schools, for example, for, for me as someone who, is, who has many family members who attended residential school, um, you know, is going to hit me differently than it might someone else for whom it might be more um, of an abstract experience, it's still real, but, you know, less hits you in the gut. Um, and so recognizing that for your friends and colleagues, and there might be, you know, other examples, you know, it's so often that there are uh, stories in the news of uh, police killings of black people, especially of um, younger black men. Um, and so 
you know, thinking of the people uh, you know who who might think, well, that could be me, or that could be a, a, a relative or friend, um, and how that might be impacting them. And then thinking about what can you do to sort of lighten just the load of the day that day? Is there a, um, a way you can let them off the hook for something or, or uh, take something off, you know, or, or even as something as simple as, you know, there's a, a friend of mine who is uh, being honest with me about their experience with uh, just, it was a rough mental health week for them. Uh, and they're in another city. And so, you know, I said, you know, are, are you eating? And do you need me to, to deliver you uh, some tacos or whatever? So you have you know, something good, good to eat today. And, um, you know, it was really simple, uh, something I was able to, you know, uh, able to manage across time and space, um, but mattered. You know, it was small, but it mattered. It both that it demonstrated care uh, and also tangibly just meant that there was one less thing to worry about for someone. And so thinking of, of those tangible acts of care, I think are really important in our, our what uh, weave us together as community. Um, sometimes though, people who are not indigenous or racialized um, are a little maybe fearful or cautious uh, about reaching out, worried that they might do something wrong or say the wrong thing. Um, uh, what, what might you offer or name in, uh, in response to that? Well, we might. Um, I think that's part of the reality of being human is, you know, we can't read each other's minds, we have to communicate and, and we make mistakes along the way. And to both be gracious with us, uh, with ourselves and gracious with one another. And, and to recognize um, that it might not, that someone's uh, frustration or anger or reaction might not be about you, but might be about something much bigger. And so to, to not take it personally and, and, uh, and not to center your own, uh, you know, emotional needs uh, in that, you know, it's not about you being seen as the hero, um, but about uh, just trying to be there for for someone else. So it's, it's imperfect. It's messy. I think, you know, if anti-racism were easy, we'd be done, um, but it's hard. And so it's going to continue. Um, you know, I, I remember there was a, a draft of an anti-racism plan that I think came to the general council executive. And uh, my comment was, you know, there was a comment about how, you know, this is going to be hard, difficult work. And I said, well, that's 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 true, unquestionably. But can it also be, you know, joyful, life-giving work? You know, shouldn't dismantling racism, uh, achieving justice, living together well, you know, shouldn't in some sense that be fun at times, uh, joyful at times, uh, hopeful? Um, I think, you know, often in these topics we turn to to negative affect, to to negative emotions of pain and suffering and those sorts of things. And, and I constantly want to lift up the, the positive ones. And that's part of that refusal to be worn out is stories of laughter and resilience and joy and celebration and dance and hope along the way. And I think that those are, are really, really vitally important. And we got to uh, name those and continue those. And so uh, I, would, I would continue with that, with, with that about uh, finding the joy along the way too. Thank you. Finding the joy. Love it. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, friends, please feel free to write, continue to ask questions in the chat. If you have additional questions that you would like to pose for Mitchell, or if you have comments uh, that you want to make about things that you've heard so far, uh, you are welcome to pose those at any time. Um, Mitchell, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, people who are not Indigenous and um, or racialized. Um, for those among us who are Indigenous or racialized, what might be some acts of refusal that we might be able to do to refuse to be worn out? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I'm going to speak personally and specifically at first, and maybe there's some threads that will draw out from that. Um, I think there is a joy in uh, cultural revitalization. You know, I was um, I drove to Regina and back yesterday from Saskatoon for a, a, a celebration. And um, I saw words in uh, Denisuthane on a, uh, a billboard. And um, I didn't know what they mean. I knew what one word meant. Uh, I, I could only see it quickly, but you know, I saw Nefe, great. Um, and, uh, but it was just such a joy to see the presence of you know, Denisuthane culture and language in the world. Um, and, you know, for me, something as simple as uh, trying to pick up the occasional uh, Denisuthane word, um, trying to find ways to, to, to work those into, um, 
my everyday life uh, have been really life-giving. You know, I think of uh, my, my Moshe, my grandfather, uh, he's Métis, uh, and uh, he uh, grew up in an era where the pressure uh, on many of the Métis was to downplay their identity, was to cease to exist or to take up space. You know, so uh, he grew up speaking uh, Michif, Cree, French, and English, and uh, over the years mostly, you know, has only ever spoken English with me. Um, there's, there's all these uh, ways where, um, you know, he tried his best to give his family a good life, and a lot of that meant assimilating into, you know, dominant uh, Anglo, you know, white culture. Um, and so, uh, well, I still often, you know, refer to him as grandpa, um, trying to use, uh, you know, Mitchiff words to describe the, our relationship or, you know, just a, a little way of, again, acknowledging that, that the past doesn't need to be the future, that things can change and, and uh, that, you know, our relationship is, is also um, affected by the, the cultures that we, we live in. Uh, and I, I think also asking ourselves, what do we need in our lives um, to sustain our bodies and souls? You know, so what's the amount of sleep you need in a, in a night or in a week? Um, what are the kinds of nutritious foods, maybe culturally appropriate nutritious foods uh, that, that help you? You know, I, I think I probably do my best work on, on a, a good fish from a northern lake uh, rather than one from, uh, one from uh, and they do sell those actually at the co-op, but rather than, you know, one from a, you know, a factory farm from wherever, um, you know, so, so those things that, that both literally and more, you know, metaphorically nourish us, I think that those are, are really important and, and again, are culturally specific. So, you know, it might be a, a, something that reminds you of home uh, if you're someone who's a newcomer to Canada or whose ancestors came to Canada, but you have ties, if you have a, an experience of diaspora, you know, uh, it might be um, a reclamation of, of language and culture. It might just be, uh, getting enough sleep. Uh, there, it's, it's all these kinds of things, but I think those are really important because, uh, you know, the world will wear you down um, if you let it, and so you have to refuse to let that happen. Great. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, this other question is, is related, so it may be uh, uh, something, uh, maybe resharing something you've already shared, but uh, where might we find energy when there are these ongoing and daily stressors, stressors in our daily lives? Well, in addition to what I've named, I would also name then the Holy Spirit uh, at work powerfully in us, um, who we know has always been the one to give the church our energy and our passion and our fire. Uh, and I think, um, you know, so, so in prayer and scripture and practices of faith, you know, at my church, we, we are currently celebrating the Lord's Supper with, you know, tiny little prepackaged wafers and just the, the least good tasting grape juice I've ever had. Um, but literally at the, the Lord's Supper, at the table of Jesus, we are nourished and sustained for our work. Um, and so to partake, uh, whether that's on a screen, uh, but to partake of the Lord's Supper, you know, it's not just a metaphorical nourishment for our souls. It's a, it's a true and real one. And I think uh, that's an important practice as well as, um, you know, we cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, I think grounding ourselves in scripture, uh, I think reminds us, you know, stories like Hagar, uh, you know, that it, she names uh, God as the one who sees, uh, that God notices uh, and notices Hagar in her uh, struggles and notices us and ours, and that God is always on the side of the struggling, as God is with Hagar, as God is with us. And so I think um, for me, I don't know how I would do what I do if I weren't a person of faith. Um, and and uh, I think my faith is, is something just that I, I experience how Jesus is at work in my life and in the world in ways that help me continue and, and keep going on. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, an encouragement again, if anyone has any questions or comments to add them in the chat. Um, and maybe Mitch, I'll turn to you. Any, any um, maybe closing thoughts or words or any additional comments that you might want to make as we start to come to the end of our time together? For sure. And again, I'd put a call out. Uh, don't be shy if you've got questions or comments or things to engage with. We'd, we'd love that. Um, 
you know, we've looked a lot at, at biblical examples, uh, which is important, of course. Um, many indigenous uh, cultures, including my own, will look at the natural world for guidance um, in terms. And so here, you know, I live in, in Saskatoon, um, where we have very pronounced seasons. You know, uh, it got to like, I don't know, 38, 39 in the summer, and we'll get into, um, I forget what it was in February, um, maybe minus 50 something with the wind chill. You know, so uh, the creatures who make this place their home um, have adopted models of life that allow them to uh, really engage in the fullness of that. And so, you know, I think, for example, of uh, bears, uh, Sas in uh, Dennis um, who have practices of hibernation. Um, what does it mean to endure uh, uh, a Saskatchewan winter? Um, maybe you need to hibernate. And so what does it mean to endure a challenging uh, piece in life? Um, to use things like, uh, what is hibernate, you know, what is, the, what is the human equivalent of hibernation? Um, and to recognize, well, if it's good for the bear, it's probably good for us. Um, same thing for, uh, you know, trees in, in where I am are now losing their leaves. Um, as a way of preserving their vitality for uh, the season ahead. Um, and so I think of that seasonality of how the, the creatures who are my neighbors, um, how do they handle hard times in life in order to enable flourishing uh, to come in the spring and in the summer. And so that would be the other place I would look to for wisdom is in the natural world around me, uh, in whether it's uh, bears hibernating or birds uh, migrating or trees uh, shedding leaves, um, what is, what are those practices? And then what does that mean for my life? Um, are there leaves I need to shed? Are there times I need to migrate? Are there times I need to hibernate? Uh, what can I learn from, you know, bears and, and geese and trees? I know. Thank you for, thank you for that, Mitchell, all that beautiful imagery. Um, uh, a few comments have emerged in the chat. Um, one person was wondering if the recording will be available. And yes, it will be available and posted online. And you'll, you're very welcome to share that uh, freely within your communities of faith and beyond. Um, some words of, of thanks and encouragement to you, Mitchell, um, um, noting that the work is hard, but that it's also joyful. Uh, so thank you for that. There's also a question that's come up. Um, so. Um, the term microaggression um, that was named near the beginning of our conversation, do we need to stop using that word? Uh, because it seems it it's, might be possible that the word is diminishing the experience that builds racial fatigue. Is there another way of naming? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll think of, um, I, I have a couple stories to engage in that. You know, I remember in my first year uh, of college at the University of Saskatchewan in a sociology class, um, we were learning about a, a concept of, um, there was like overt racism and then and maybe it was covert racism. And I raised my hand and I was like, I think it's only covert to white people. Like, I, I think it's always obvious to me what's happening. Um, and I don't know if other people of color have the same experience, but like, it's never covert. It's always obvious. I think it's just, I think you're deluding yourself with this uh, categorization. Um, and luckily, the the prof who was a uh, you know a white guy took that took that engagement seriously um, from a you know a little uh, feisty eighteen year old or whatever I was at the time. Um, so I, I I appreciate that in terms that sometimes we we create they're all imperfect of course, uh, but that sometimes we create terms to try to name those um, you know we've got the spectacular uh, and then but in the everyday like Lauren Berlant might talk about. Um, we, we struggle at naming those. Um, and so, you know, one, uh, I, can, I can, you know, name dozens, maybe hundreds um, of those, you know, microaggressive moments. Um, but the reason why I can name them is because they really left a mark on me. Um, you know, they didn't feel micro uh, in the moment. Um, you know, there is a shopper's drug mart in Regina that I still tense up every time I go to uh, because of experiences I've had there. Um, you know, that's not micro um, if it leaves that, that kind of mark on, on someone. So uh, I appreciate words are always imperfect. Um, and, and I don't think microaggression is wrong, um, but I think, you know, yeah, is it micro? Those moments don't really feel micro to me, but I don't know what to call them. Um, you know, I just say, you know, some bad stuff happened at the uh, Shoppers Drug Mart on, on Broad in Regina um, or, I could name, you know, dozens of other places. 
And, and I'll also just note as, as part of the 40 days of engagement, there is a day coming up that does focus on microaggressions. So that will be a, a good day to delve in and explore and, and think about what words are being used and what alternatives are being proposed. So you can look for that day coming up uh, ahead. Um, Mitchell, another question has uh, come up in the chat here, um, seeing that um, from a non-racialized bilingual person, who has the experience of being a ling linguistic minority um, where French is not recognized when it should be and feeling the fatigue of constantly having to advocate for using the French language. So the person is, is uh, feeling an interest in wanting to see indigenous words in some of what we do uh, mm -hmm. from a language in territories. Is something that's being considered um, and maybe any comments on that? Yeah, a, a few things. So first, just to thank you for sharing that experience. I think that's um, that's resonant um, with me, certainly. Uh, and I think important to recognize, you know, we talked about minority stress earlier, that absolutely, I know it's a real experience, uh, being a linguistic minority and in a very Anglo church uh, in, a, in a country that's ostensibly bilingual, but definitely fails to live up to that in most parts of most parts of where we are. Um, and so a, a few thoughts. Um, I think one is um, not to take up space from indigenous people learning um, our own languages. And so, you know, I think of, um, there was a member of parliament, I, I honestly don't remember who, um, who was being celebrated for having learned, having studied, I think it was Kanye Kahag. Um, and that was great, you know, and, and this was a non-Indigenous person. Um, but it begged the question then about, well, what about all of the Mohawk youth who don't have the opportunity to learn the language? Um, what does that look like for them? And so, again, all of this is messy and none of this is easy. Uh, but that's the one question I would ask. And the other is, um, you know, words contain meaning in profound depth of meaning. And so to, to use them well and to use them carefully and respectfully um, and, uh, you know, I, it, I have sometimes seen in the United Church and in other spaces of well-meaning people uh, wanting to use Indigenous things uh, and not always doing it well. Um, and so to, to take the lead from, from Indigenous people, uh, and to, to be in, in authentic relationship and dialogue with them, uh, with us, as the case may be. Uh, so not to sing a Cree verse of Amazing Grace and Voices United just because you can, uh, but to sing it with purpose and in some way in an authentic connection with uh, the people whose, whose language you're using. Um, so to, I know that's not an easy answer, but to just really think through um, and, and perhaps to reflect on your own experience as a linguistic minority about what would feel right in the use of French uh, by non-French people. Um, that's not a perfect analog, but it's a place to start. All right, thanks, Mitchell. Um, there are some increasing words of thanks and appreciation to you for your, your thoughts and comments and insights today. Um, I wonder if this might be a natural place to, um, to start to, to come to an end for our conversation today, although the conversation will continue in other ways. Um, and so maybe I'll turn back to you to offer uh, a last, um, last words or closing reflections um, as we close off our time. Thank you, Tannis, you have that correct, yes. Uh, and um, my former hometown MP, Georgina Jolabois, uh, Dene woman, um, also gave speeches in uh, indigenous languages, but uh, after the, that story, I think you're, you're referencing. Thank you for filling in the, the gaps in my memory. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, engaging in this and, um, and in the time for reflect and in allowing me to engage in something that's incomplete. You know, I don't have a nice neat answer at the end about, okay, here's the seven steps to, uh, you know, energy and rest and renewal in anti-racist work. Uh, but a lot of questions for us to think through and ones that, that don't have obvious, easy answers. Um, because I really believe in the importance of um, the continuingness of this work. Again, going back to Lauren Berlant's work, um, if, if you know, a, oppression is every day, then resistance and resurgence and refusal is every day. Um, and how do we embed and weave it into everyday practices? Um, and I saw, I think, a, a, a chat from um, 
Jennifer about um, we make renewal work, we make self care work, um, and to avoid uh, trying to do that, 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 you know, renewal and refusal and rest shouldn't be another thing on a checklist. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I'm the kind of person who makes that uh, part of my checklist, but needs to be part of our rhythm of life. Um, and again, here I would, I would look to examples of, um, of, you know, bears hibernating or geese migrating or trees shedding leaves um, as, as offering us wisdom and guidance and inspiration for what does that might, might that look like for us? What might we need to shed? Uh, what might we need to uh, hibernate? When might we need to hibernate? What we, might we need to migrate away from? Um, and I think that that's good wisdom for, for all of us to, to reflect on those questions as we try to build a more inclusive world for all of us. Thank you again, Mitchell, for this time. And uh, everyone, you can see there are some, some links that have been posted in the chat where you can find more content for the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism and specifically to where you can find Mitchell's piece on racial fatigue, if you have not had the chance to explore that for today just yet. Uh, so lots of content is available there um, for today and other days. So thank you once again, Mitchell, for engaging us in this rich and full conversation about uh, racial fatigue and for guiding us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dal. Thank you to the people with the hearts and the, the clapping emojis. Uh, Rob, should I stop the recording?